we start the recording? Um, all right, Mike, I will turn off my camera and um, audio, and the show is now yours, sir. Take it away. Okay. Let's let's see if I can get my presentation. Uh, okay, is it full screen for you? Um, so um, the uh, I'm going to talk about compressed air, specifically talking about the Mike, we don't have the presentation yet. I don't see it. Oh, okay. All right. Let's see here. I hit the, let's see, share. Ah, I was not sharing the right screen. There we go. Thank you. Okay. What do you see now? I see PowerPoint, but not in presenter mode. Okay. Now I'm going to get it to presenter mode. And now we Excellent. should be good. Yes, okay, sir. great. Thank you. So um, we're going to talk about compressed air. Uh, this is kind of part two of the one we did a couple weeks ago. We talked about compressors, types, and sizing, but this time we're going to talk about air quality. Um, you know, the, the availability of compressed air with steady pressure to all the points of use uh, is really critical to uh, auto body operations, um, but air quality is equally important. You know, if the air is oily or wet or dirty, uh, that di that directly impacts productivity. Um, bad air not only wears out tools faster, um, but uh, the negative impact is actually more easily seen in the paint department. Um, flaws in paints and clears from compressed air waste some of your most expensive labor, uh, as well as the materials that if you're you know if you're going to redo, um, you know there's the uh, the paint, the abrasives, and so forth. So there's a lot of lost productivity there. So you don't need me to tell you how this hurts your throughput and your profitability. Um, uh, so today we'll talk about ways to, to uh, clean up the air. So we'll talk about uh, first about what some of those problems are, and then we're going to talk about different types of, of products. Now, a lot of the photos of these products are going to be, you know, black and yellow because that's what I have in my uh, um, photo album here at Kaiser, but these are products, um, these are solutions that are widely available. So uh, I'm not promoting a particular Kaiser uh, product here. Um, yeah, we have them, so do many others. So uh, it's really about the type, applying the right type of solution. So first we'll talk about the air quality and contaminants. So basically, we categorize them into three, three types. Moisture, both uh, in liquid and vapor form. Hydrocarbons is sort of a, a general term that uh, refers to oils. Um, it could be WD-40, it could be silicone spray, it could be compressor oil. And these are found in liquid form, aerosol form, or vapor uh, as well. Particulates, dirt, dust, rust. You know, if it's a dusty environment, um, uh, which a lot of shops have, you know, the compressed air can pick that up. So um, those are the three types. And of course, the results, you know, we talked about, you know, the uh, bad finish quality, rework, wearing tools out faster, and reducing your, th your throughput. And, you know, we've seen time and again that the cost and, uh, and um, it, it's easy to, to see what the price of a a dryer cost and the price of a filter and you know or new piping and it's harder to to calculate what the lost productivity and lost labor and lost materials are but you know when we do look at it um, those who who've tracked it basically the cost of the time and materials from defects definitely exceeds the cost of making your system right okay that's a basic thing to keep in mind so moisture, you know, think of water and think of the weather. Hotter air holds more moisture. That's why the summertime is more humid. And fun fact, every 20 degree uh, change in air temperature either doubles or halves air's ability to hold moisture. So if the temperature goes up 20 degrees, that doubles air's ability to hold air or hold moisture in a vapor state and doubles the amount of moisture in that air. Um, you cool the air, you can uh, condense liquid out, and that's how we're gonna solve some problems. Um, higher pressure also squeezes water out from the air. So that's why when we get a high pressure system, you know, we tend to have drier, drier weather. So um, 
uh, and then that cooling again condenses vapor to liquid. Um, so um, the moisture, we already talked about some of the problems with finish quality, extending, you know, the flash and drying times, uh, but it, and uh, wearing out tools, but it can also rust out piping if you have iron piping. So that's, uh, that's another downside to moisture. Okay, so here's just kind of a, an example um, to uh, put it in perspective. If, you, if it were a 75 degree day or if the compressor room were 75 degrees and the relative humidity was about 75 um, and you had a 10 horsepower compressor pulling in about, you know, 40 CFM, in an eight hour, you know, uh, work day, you might pull two gallons of water in there. Of course, higher humidity, more water, higher uh, flows, more water. So uh, uh, the hotter it is, the more humid it is, and the more air you're, you're using, uh, the more water you are putting into your compressed air stream. All right. Um, now, uh, the last point here is um, uh, I haven't explained pressure dew point, but PDP, basically, um, we'll get into that a little bit. But if you keep the compressed air temperature below the ambient temperature, in this case, 75 degrees, the moisture in that compressed air will stay as a vapor, okay? So, and that's gonna be important when we talk about dryers. All right, so we'll move on here. Hydrocarbons, often we just refer to those as oils. Uh, again, they can be in different forms. A lot of different sources mention some of those. Again, it could be solvents, it could be WD-40, it could be compressor oil. Um, and all compressors pass on some uh, compressor oil, some more than others. Um, so obviously you, you know better than I do what it'll do to your, your paint jobs. Um, and it can gum up um, your tools too. Um, so there are several places in the system where it can be removed um, at, to different degrees. One of the key things here is to know that a filter is gonna remove those mists, oily mists, and that those filters need to be high, uh, coalescing filters. So to get that stuff out, it's got to be coalescing because uh, there are other types of filters that aren't coalescing. Particulates. Um, again, they can be picked up in the, the, from the compressor room or, or in, the, in the air, if the, even if the compressor is drawing in fresh air from outside. If it's in the air, it's going to go uh, into that compressor. A lot of times the filter in the compressor will take some of that out, but some of this really small stuff is going to get through. Uh, so you want to remove it downstream of the compressor. And this is easily done. Okay, so we'll start talking about some of the solutions. So the first thing is receiver tanks. You know, these do a number of things. Of course, they store air um, to help uh, control compressor cycling and store air for periods of high demand. But on the air treatment side of things, it's your first stage of air liquid separation. So it's a place for um, water to drop out um, after it cools a little bit from the compressor and, uh, and you wanna drain it away. Um, so it, um, this reduces the amount of moisture that is gonna go into your dryer and, and filter. So it makes them more effective. Um, uh, so tanks are definitely, we think of them as part of the, uh, just the, the way we store air and let the compressor turn off, but very important for liquid separation. Okay, we all, this, these are just some tips for sizing um, comp uh, tanks. So two to four gallons per CFM. And uh, you wanna keep them, you don't wanna put them in a hot environment. Uh, they can be outside if they're in the shade but you don't want them in the boiler room because if that tank is warm, the air inside is warm, that means the moisture isn't gonna condense as much in it, okay? And you wanna put a good automatic drain on there because if it's just a manual valve that someone has to remember to open up, it won't get done. Uh, and you'll have a tank that starts to accumulate water, which is bad for your air compressed air quality. And it also, means your tank is not doing the other things it's supposed to do, like let the compressor turn off, cool down, or store uh, air for little um, uh, spurts of excess demand. Okay, so uh, you definitely want to make sure it has a good automatic drain in there. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about drains later on. 
Okay, so now we'll get into the big topic, which is dryers. So there are a lot of different kinds of dryers. These are the, the main method of removing moisture. Okay, so you can remove liquids through tanks and um, a, uh, a, a moisture separator looks like a filter, but it's, it's not. Um, and we'll show that later. But the, uh, the dryer is what's gonna take moisture vapor and remove it. All right, so there are different types uh, we'll get into, and they have different levels of performance. Uh, different, you know, um, some are, uh, there are many different sizes, and, and some uh, work better than others. Um, but um, um, the dryer is the, the, the key to uh, getting moisture out of your system. All right, so one of the terms I, I, I used earlier was pressure dew point. This is the compressor world's um, terminology for expressing the amount of moisture in compressed air. So if we say the pressure dew point or the dew point is 45 degrees, that means that 45 degrees is the temperature um, above which you won't see liquid moisture. So there may still be moisture vapor, but unless that air gets chilled below the dew point, it won't turn to water, okay? So, um, and that's going to, uh, that's going to vary with pressure. So, uh, and it's, but it, it is regardless of what the ambient temperature is, but it does vary with pressure, okay? And we'll talk about dryer ratings and you'll see how that's applied. Okay, so first we're going to focus on refrigerated dryers, which is the most common, rightfully, the most common type that you uh, should have in, in your shop. Um, uh, because that's going to do the bulk of the moisture removal and it can help, um, it should be what you use to dry up your main shop air. Okay, so not just for the booth, but also for um, your, your other pneumatic tools. Okay, so here's a uh, diagram of uh, how it works. We're going to go into this uh, in, in detail. No, I'm kidding. Um, um, basically, we're going to keep it simple. A refrigerated dryer works like a refrigerator. It chills the air so that any, so that a lot, not all, but a lot of the moisture vapor will condense into liquid. So um, there's kind of uh, four basic elements um, in the operation of a dryer. Um, so, so first of all, the air that's going from the compressor into the dryer is warm. Uh, it, depending on the type of uh, compressor and how much piping it's gone through, you know, it's easily, it could be 100 degrees, it could be 150 degrees. Um, that air is going to be cooled by the outgoing air of the dryer. So the first step to drying the air is actually using the coolness of the outgoing air to cool, to um, warm up the outgoing air, which has a benefit, and cool down the incoming air, which makes the refrigeration more effective. So then the next thing it does, so some of the moisture is going to condense in, from vapor to liquid in the air to air heat exchanger, which is the first step. Then it's going to go through a refrigeration um, uh, circuit, which is, again, it's, it's kind of like your refrigerator. There's an actual refrigerant compressor in there, and it is going to chill the air down to, and it, this is going to vary by model um, and make, but let's say 40 degrees. Fahrenheit. That's a common target for a refrigerated dryer. So it's going to chill that compressed air down to about 40 degrees. And then um, more of the water is going to condense into liquid. And then you see that there's a place for that condensed liquid to drain out, both from the air to air heat exchanger and the refrigeration itself. So you get that water, those water droplets out. Um, and then you rewarm the air going out. And the, one of the purposes there, one is to help cool the air going in, but it also means you're raising the temperature of the compressed air above the dew point. So the dew point's 40 degrees because it went through this refrigeration. Now you're going to raise it back up by passing it by 100 degree air, and you might get it to, you know, 75 degrees, let's say, uh, for argument's sake. 
and now your your compressed air temperature is well above the dew point so you're not going to see uh, liquid water there are some uh, there are some exceptions to that and we'll talk about that later on okay so refrigerated dryers um, I, I like to think of them in two types um, basically they're just a box with the, you know a condenser unit with a fan uh, the refrigeration circuit and a drain. Some will have built in um, uh, like a basic particulate filter uh, or maybe a liquid separator. Um, but the two types, uh, the way I like to think of it is some that are, that are designed to be used with rotary screw and rotary vane compressors. And those can get down to about 38, 40, 45 degree dew points. Again, it depends on the spec of the dryer. Uh, and how you size it. Um, and then there are the high temperature models. And these are designed for use, use with piston compressors, which operate much hotter. So the air coming out of a piston is way hotter than what comes out of a rotary vane or rotary screw. So you need to have a dryer that's, that's, gonna, that's built for that. Those are not gonna get down to the same low dew points. So a good high temp refrigerator dryer might get you down to 50, 55, whereas you might get down to, you know, close to 38, 35 degrees um, if you're using the type with a rotary screw or rotary vane type compressor. Okay, so that's an important um, point because it means you're removing more moisture because you're starting from a lower temperature and that helps. Okay, so this is just another quick comparison to that. So you're, you're, let's say you've got two different compressors um, in the same room. The room temp is the same, but the, the, what's called the approach temperature, which means how much hotter than the room temp, the, air, the compressor will make that air. Um, so the, com the compressed air coming out of a piston compressor might you know, go in at 80, but it might rise 100 degrees and come out 180 could be two, 250. Um, uh, the rotary screw, much lower approach temperature, sometimes as low as, uh, we'll say between 10 and 20 degrees. So the temperature rise is not nearly as, uh, as high. So it allows you to use a, a different type of refrigerated dryer and get a lower dew point, i.e. drier air. So refrigerated dryers are all um, rated to dry a certain amount of air in CFM at standard conditions. So the industry standard conditions, and this isn't a Kaser thing, it's just a compressed air industry thing. The standard conditions are typically 100 degrees ambient, 100 degrees compressed air temperature, and 100 uh, PSI pressure. So you don't, no one operates at those standard conditions, so you have to adjust the dryer size based on your actual conditions because the, the dryers are affected by how hot the room is, how high the pressure is, and the compressed air temperature. Um, and those things can operate in different directions. So lower room temperature makes your dryer more effective. Lower compressed air temperature does the same, but higher pressure makes it um, more effective. So we're going to show you some uh, examples. Um, the, the key to remember is when you're picking your dryer and sizing it, to size it for your worst case. So that's usually summertime because that's when it's uh, most hot and humid. All right, so our scenario is you have an 88 CFM compressor, um, which is from a real model, um, and, and a dryer rated for 95 CFM at standard conditions, okay? And, and just so you know, it's very common that compressors and dryers aren't gonna output, you know, put out even numbers like 50 or 75 or 100 CFM. Um, so that's why there's an 88 and a 95. They're, those are real models that I took from uh, a, somebody's website. So the, um, the real, but in this scenario, your conditions are actually a 90 degree room which is a benefit, 105 degree compressed air temperature, which we have to adjust for, and 125 degree, 125 PSI pressure. 
Um, and the other thing to keep in mind is that the peak demand in your shop is about 75 CFM. So someone, you've got a compressor that puts out 88, but you've got a, um, a peak demand. The most any that you've, that you, you may not know what your peak demand is, but in this scenario, the peak demand is the most anyone ever uses is 75 CFM. So that's good. That means you've got a well-sized uh, compressor. So this chart, which is going to come on the back of most uh, 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 dryer uh, literature or will be available from the manufacturer, basically tells you how to adjust the dryer size um, that you're looking to buy based on your ambient conditions. So the purple lines um, point to the, um, the standard conditions, and then you need to kind of uh, kind of use the the matrix to see where you are. So um, down below is the ambient temperature box. And in this case, your room temperature is below the standard condition because the standard condition is 100. You've got 90 degree air. So that's a little that's a little positive. So you have a, a um, correction factor of 1.06. So anything above one is means you get to make your dryer your dryer uh, acts bigger than it is. And if you, but on the other side, your compressed air temperature is above 105, is above 100. It's 105 uh, based on the 90 degree room and the 15 degree temperature rise in the compressor. And so that you have to derate your dryer a little bit. And, and the pressure is 125. Um, and so you use that matrix, you find the pressure on the left, um, and then you go over to the temperature uh, column. So in this case, you have a, an adjustment of 0.87. So you multiply those two together, 0.87, um, and then times 1.06, and your total correction factor is 0.92. And then what you do is you take that, we're gonna look at the top line here, you take that 0.92 and multiply it times the, the capacity of the dryer at standard conditions, which you may recall was 95. So a 95 CFM dryer in these conditions is really good to size uh, to, to dry 87 CFM, okay? Um, so how much air are we, are we drying? Well, the compressor would make 88. So we're basically talking about the same, but remember we said our peak flow is only 75. So in this case, you're in great shape, okay? So these other lines just indicate if you had different temperature conditions and different pressures, how you would adjust that, uh, the drying capacity of that 95 CFM dryer. So if you drop the room temp another 10 degrees um, and a little bit on the compressor side, boy, now you can, you could you could have an even bigger compressor flowing through that 95 CFM dryer. That's the point. Okay, so um, those correction factors are really important to make sure that you uh, you've selected the right dryer. Okay, so now we're going to talk about other dryers, um, and we're going to start off with desiccant dryers. Okay. So desiccant come, there are different types of desiccant. Uh, you may uh, have seen desiccant come in a pair of shoes or some other, or uh, some electronic product that you ordered off Amazon. And it's basically a way of adsorbing moisture. So moisture molecules in the air will adhere to or adsorb to some material. In this case, uh, silica, it's, but often it's in compressed air, we use activated alumina. Um, so desk and dryers um, are very effective at drying air beyond what a refrigerated dryer will do. However, they um, are more expensive and um, uh, in some cases they use compressed air, they consume it. So um, we like to recommend that in the auto body world, Desk and dryers should only be used at a point of use, I specifically the spray booth. If, if you feel like you need to dry the air more from the refrigerated dryer to get a good paint finish, then you, you get a small, you get a, a, a refrigerated dryer to dry all your air, and then you get 
a small desk and dryer just to dry the air in the paint booth. Now, a lot of people have these systems that they may not realize are desk and dryers. You'll sometimes on the wall of a paint booth is a, is a multi element or multi canister setup that will include a coalescing filter and a desk and, and something else. So you may actually have something like this and, um, uh, and not realize exactly what's in it. Um, the other time, someone may need a desk and dryer is if the piping, the compressed air piping goes someplace cold after it leaves the refrigerated dryer. If it goes outside in Minnesota, that 40 degree dew point isn't going to, isn't going to help you. Okay. So what you need to do is super dry the air before it goes outside. So you don't have water freezing in your lines. Okay. So, in the auto body world, that's not a common scenario. So, um, and if it, if it did occur for you, then you'd have to have a bigger dryer to dry all your air if it went to another building before it's used. So hopefully you don't have that um, uh, because that it gets more expensive. Um, the paint booth is really the main place you would see a desk and dryer in the auto body arena. So I'm going to briefly explain how these things work. I'm going to talk about twin tower and single tower. In this slide, we're just going to talk about twin tower. So the idea is with a, with a desk and dryer that the, the air goes into the dryer. It's got to go through a coalescing filter because the coalescing filter, if you don't remove oils, they are going to coat the desiccant material and the desiccant material, which is meant to be hydrophilic, meaning water loving, will become hydrophobic, water hating, just like oil and water. And you will not dry the air uh, and you'll have to throw out the desiccant. Um, and, but the idea is your compressed air goes in on the left side and it um, is going to go up through those red beads sort of go up through, and as it goes through this bed of beads of desiccant material, it's going to get dried. And then it's going to go uh, out the top. Most of the air is going to go out to the right through a dust filter because desiccant breaks down over time. And then a some percentage of the dry air is going to go through the other tower, which was previously used um, to dry, and it's going to sweep the wet the wetness off of the desiccant from the earlier tower, and it's going to be pur it's going to purge out of a muffler, um, and uh, every now and then you'll have this blast of um, um, of air coming out of a desiccant dryer. So you basically use 15 to 20 percent of your of the capacity of the dryer to dry the wet side of the dryer, and then on a timer it's going to switch back. So that timer is what determines the dew point. So a desiccant dryer, um, you can get down to a minus 40 degree dew point. You know, in, in uh, your application, I would probably recommend setting it to give you a zero um, Fahrenheit dew point, um, and, uh, which will waste less air and, um, um, and work just fine. Um, but again, if that air has to go outside, um, and it's minus, and it's negative temperatures, then you mean, then you need to set the dew point lower. Okay. So, um, most of the in compressed air, uh, or the industrial, um, twin tower desk and dryers will use active activated alumina. Um, and they have that timer setting that has, that actually has a dew point control. Um, the regeneration that back and forth means your desiccant will last longer but you got, you're paying a price. It's more expensive to buy than a refrigerator dryer. Um, and um, it does require a little electricity and it uses compressed air. So uh, again, you don't want to oversize these things because they don't use 15 to 20% of the air that you want them to dry. They, they use 15 to 20% of the capacity of the dryer. So if you buy a big dryer because you got a great deal on eBay, it's, and, and it's going to suck up all the air it wants to dry the other side. Uh, and not, uh, not just, you know, the 20 CFM you, you need dried. Okay. Um, so 
um, th those are some down. So the performance level is very high, but there are costs to it. So you can get these as single towers. Uh, the single towers, they don't, obviously, they don't go back and forth. Um, they can still get very dry air. You want to put them downstream of a refrigerated dryer. Uh, again, great for the paint booth. Um, they don't have dew point control. Um, they may use a silica gel. They're less expensive than the twin tower for obvious reasons. They don't need electricity. They don't have much pressure drop. They don't use compressed air. Um, and, uh, but you still need the, the coalescing pre-filtration to, to make that desiccant work. Uh, and then you have to periodically um, either replace the desiccant or take it out and bake it. Literally put it in an oven to heat it up, get the moisture off of it, and then put it back in. Okay, so that's the downside. Okay, um, and and it, you don't have to do it that often. Uh, it basically depends on the size of the the tower and how much air you're flowing through it. Um, so you can, um, if you're looking at those, you can figure that out before you buy it. Okay, uh, so single tower desiccant, great um, a dew point suppression. You can get really good dry air. Great for the paint booth um, and less expensive than that more complex twin tower. So another single tower option, uh, it, I was going to show you a picture, but in, in our case, they, it looks identical to the single tower. It's just a, a pre-filter and a, a filter canister. But inside is this bundle of membranes, these, these uh, very, very, very fine uh, tubes that will allow moisture vapor to separate from air. Um, and this also consumes air. So it's a great way for if you want a dry air point of use, but it does consume air and add a little more pressure drop. Okay, so um, if you just have a small application and you want to add a little dew point suppression to it uh, at the point of use, a membrane dryer is another cost effective way to do that. Okay, um, again, great for the paint booth, not for the whole shop. Uh, and you got to protect the, uh, the membrane from oils or it will not work. Okay, so this doesn't come up too often, but I have seen it out there. Um, every now and then someone, I see a company promoting nitrogen uh, to paint with nitrogen and basically saying how much cleaner and drier it is. Um, and um, so I wanted to address that. Um, so nitrogen separation, um, well, to create these nitrogen systems, basically they use a compressor. They, they tap in, they're a system that taps into your compressed air and it uses the partial pressure of the different gases in air to separate nitrogen from oxygen and other trace gases. It often uses a membrane, uh, very similar to the membrane we just looked at. Um, and, but it's that membrane is, is designed specifically to remove nitrogen from oxygen. And it allows the oxygen to get out and it holds onto the nitrogen. So um, the way it really improves the air quality is it just is that you have to dry and clean the air really well before it goes into that membrane system for it to work. So the dryers and filters that you needed, yeah, I mean, you're using for the membrane or for this uh, uh, nitrogen membrane system you can just apply to the air and get basically the same result. So the, the, it's the cleaning of the air to protect the membrane and the nitrogen separator that is what cleans up the air or the gas. Um, so it's, to me, it's an, ex, it's an extra expense, um, several thousand dollars that I don't think brings a great benefit um, we used to sell nitrogen systems um, for other applications, so I'm not anti-nitrogen. I just think that it's a little bit of a gimmick. But if someone has experience with this and you've got a, a you know, I'd, you can uh, send me a note because I would love to hear more about it. It's very uncommon. It does add cost um, because you're also consuming compressed air to, to make nitrogen. Okay, so that's uh, a word about that. It may not apply to anyone here, but uh, I do see it advertised sometimes. So the other thing I've seen um, is this idea of um, um, heating compressed air. Um, and 
I have not talked to anyone who's done this, um, but I was looking at some websites for companies that that offer compressed air heaters, again, for paint specifically for before you go into the paint booth, They're basically saying it's going to uh, uh, reduce the dry time. So what it, this is doing is it is further increasing the temperature above the dew point so that you have far less chance of moisture formation. And, um, and I suppose it, it, would, it could help with flash times. I don't know. Um, again, I would, if anyone's using a system like this, I would love to hear about it um, to know whether it's something we would recommend to people. Um, it doesn't affect the compressor or dryer filter combination you use. It's just something you do in addition. So um, yeah, if someone's doing that, maybe uh, uh, you can share that with me. Okay, so um, now we'll talk about uh, filters and drains a little bit. So filters often look very similar on the outside, some sort of canister, often with a, um, a um, differential pressure gauge of some kind and often with a drain hanging off the bottom. Sometimes the drain is internal. Again, it just depends on the, uh, the size and uh, the quality of drain, the size of the filter and the quality of drain that you buy. Um, so the three basic types, I'll, I'll call a moisture separator a filter, even though it is not literally a filter. It typically just spins water out in, with a mechanical motion or, you know, it directs air in a way that it spins around and the, the heavy water droplets fall to the bottom to be drained off. Sometimes these are built into refrigerant dryers. Sometimes they will um, have a, some sort of a basic filter in them. And then you know, like a particulate filter, so they could be a combination moisture separator and part of particulate filter, which is which can be great. Um, and typically, you're going to put those either um, you're going to put those before the refrigerant dryer. Okay. Now there are um, um, particulate filters. Uh, these are the things to remove dirt, dust, rust, um, desiccant dust. So if it's if you're using a refrigerant dryer only, you'd put it before that. You but if you have a desk and dryer, you definitely want one after the desk and dryer. Now, in a, if you had both dryers together, you could use a, a filter, particulate filter size for the complete flow before the refrigerant dryer to protect it, and a small one after the desk and dryer to remove desk and dust. Okay. Um, and then the coalescing filter, which I really want to emphasize again, uh, this is the, the one for anyone who's spraying paint. And, and finishes, this is vital, okay? Um, and you, you want it after a refrigerant dryer, but before a desk and, or a membrane dryer. In, um, so it not only cleans up the air um, in all three cases, but in the case of a desk and or membrane, it is vital to make those things work because if, if they get oily inside, they just won't work. Okay, and then, and as I said, they, are, they tend to be more expensive than the refrigeration dryer. So you want to have you want your filters to have some form of automatic drain. Uh, it can be external, like the one shown here, or it can be an internal that's inside the bottom of the canister. Again, different drains um, mechanisms have different. Uh, uh, some are more reliable than others, um, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. Um, and you want to replace filters on a schedule in conjunction with looking at that differential pressure gauge. But I don't want you to rely on that gauge because if a filter goes bad and like gets a hole in it or someone, <laughs> someone opens the canister to replace a filter and then they realize they don't have the right filter and puts the canister back on without the filter element, that pressure gauge will say, green, no pressure drop. And uh, or if the or if the filter element is so old that it got so clogged that it got ripped open, it will then have no pressure drop and everything will look great on the outside, but it's not filtering your air anymore. So you you want to you you want to have a differential pressure gauge for kind of a, a quick check, but you want to replace those elements on some sort of a schedule, and it may be only annually. It, a lot of that will depend on how big the filter is and how much flow you put in it and when you're buying it, someone can help you figure that out, okay? Um, so drain traps, I've mentioned this a couple times. So there are 
we categorize these into four types. The manual drain, whether it's a little uh, uh, spigot-like drain here or a ball valve on the bottom of a tank, um, very simple, and but it's only as reliable as the person who's supposed to open it up, okay? Um, and again, in the summertime, you may be building up moisture in that tank pretty rapidly, and unless someone's on it, that tank could get full of water pretty quick. So not a big fan of manual drains um, for that reason alone. Uh, a, a very common type that's been out there for decades, it was always you know, very popular, were, and Kaiser used to sell them as well, timed electric drains. Um, these things basically every, you, you would set a timer for it to open every, let's say five minutes, and you'd set it to when it opens to open every, for five seconds. So every five minutes, a blast of compressed air which is, you know, would come out of it. Sometimes people would run a tube to a bucket to collect that stuff. Um, sometimes not. It would just, you'd be walking by and they would, you know, the tank and you'd get, you know, something scared out of you by a blast of air. Um, the thing, the, the problem with these is they waste compressed air and they don't know, they just use a timer. They don't know when there's moisture to be removed or not. And in the summertime, they're, they may need to go more be, um, reset to empty liquids more frequently. And then in the wintertime to save air, you may want to dial them back. And it's just, it's all guesswork. Um, so timed electric traps um, or drains um, have kind of fallen out of favor. Uh, and then there's, so what we like are what we call demand drains, which means they operate when there's a, a need for them to, when there's a demand. So that can be a simple flotation device that when the liquid level rises up, the, the float uh, basically opens up a valve and lets the, uh, lets the compressed air push out the moisture um, or some form of electronic uh, a capacitance sensor, a drain with a sensor that basically says, okay, I sense water in here. Um, I'm going to open up until the water's gone and then close. So the demand drains, the that I show on the bottom of the slide will both operate, turn open up when there's liquid to remove and then stop when it's gone. So that saves compressed air. All right. So you want, depending on, um, uh, you may want different sizes of these, like your tank is going to have the biggest moisture load. So it may need the largest one. And then your, your other, um, um, your moisture separators, coalescing filters and dryers may need smaller ones. Dusk and dryer doesn't need a drain um, uh, at all, but uh, or a vape or a membrane doesn't need a uh, drain at all. So, um, yeah, you definitely want to have a, a you know a good uh, demand drain on there. Okay, otherwise the tank fills up with water. That water gets carried and and oily stuff gets carried downstream, overloads dryers, filters, and it can get into your um, into your your products, you know, um, and tools. So. The drain is really, it's a, I mean, a couple hundred dollar investment, but it's, it can be the Achilles heel of a compressed air system that is otherwise very good. Okay, now I'm going to switch gears from air quality and talk about pipe sizing. Okay, and, uh, and then we're going to wrap it up with a few slides on piping. Okay, so one of the things about compressed air is you, um, inside you want laminar flow as opposed to turbulent flow. And the basic reason is pressure drop. If there's turbulent flow due to a rough surface, for example, uh, or a lot of bends and, uh, and twists in the piping, that will uh, increase pressure drop. Okay. So uh, just to give you an example, um, I'm going to pick the middle one here. If you had 60 CFM, which is, let's say, a 15 horsepower, just to put it in perspective. If you had a 15 horsepower compressor, and um, putting out uh, 60 CFM, and in this situation, the pressure is 100 PSI. Um, you'll notice that in these columns, that the, the, the pressure drop through 500, I'm sorry, through 1,000 feet of pipe, which is you know, probably more than uh, the typical auto body shop, but, um, um, it you just if if you 
if your building is, uh, if, if there's only 500 feet of piping, you just cut this number in half, et cetera. But so if you had a thousand feet of straight pipe, smooth pipe, that 60 CFM would create 36 pounds of pressure drop in a three quarter inch line. Okay, so that's too small of a line. Um, you, and if you just increase that line to a one inch diameter, that 36 pounds of pressure drop drops to 10. Now that, if you only had, you know, if your shop um, were only, a, you know, 100 by 100 feet, hey, you, you know, you're a 400, you know, 200 foot um, length of pipe, you know, then you only have a few pounds total pressure drop in that 200 feet of uh, piping. That one inch line may be fine. Okay. If you drop it down even more to, or increase the size of the pipe even more, you, it, it drops the pressure drop even further. Okay, so this is uh, this is a chart from the Compressed Air and Gas Institute, um, and um, it just is meant to highlight the importance of pipe diameter uh, and its effect on pressure drop. Okay, so if you have a, and the way you want to think about this is the future. So it's um, you definitely want to size your piping with the future in mind because it's a lot easier to add compressors when you need more air than it is to repipe when you find you have added compressors but you don't have enough pipe diameter to handle the volume of air going through them. Okay. So piping materials. Um, we have a couple that we prefer. Um, and um, for industrial um, applications, which we include the auto body world in, um, the industrial application. Um, the um, very common to see black iron or galvanized, um, and they're very modest in, in price and easily available, um, but they do are, have uh, more pressure drop because they are rough inside. And in the case of black iron, that's not galvanized, um, you're gonna have a lot of rust. Um, and scale, and that will over time reduce the inside diameter of the pipe. It will build up, um, and you might think you have a one inch line, but you actually have a half inch line, and you might have pressure problems and you don't realize it's because of that. So we really have always liked copper um, and uh, aluminum, which is a, in the last 15 years, a new entry into the compressed air market. Um, but um, those two smooth, they don't rust, um, they, um, the material cost is higher, um, but typically the installation cost is lower. They're lighter weight, easier to handle, so forth. And you can, um, it's a lot easier to add a drop to copper or aluminum um, if you add a new workstation than it is if you have a threaded system, galvanized or black iron. So um, from an air quality perspective, copper and aluminum are not introducing rust or scale. Um, so that's why we, uh, um, uh, we like them and also because they'll have less pressure drop over their life um, than those other two, okay? Uh, you'll notice I did not mention PVC. Um, we're not a fan of plastics. They are often uh, not allowed by, uh, uh, by code. Um, and even though there is pressure rated PVC, uh, we have seen this happen. This was a two inch line that, that burst. Um, um, and it was pressure rated, um, but it can, over time, PVC, it can get brittle. Um, and if it's exposed to, you know, if it gets sunlight on it, that will accelerate that. And uh, it's just, it's not good when shards of it spray across the shop, which I always thought was an apocryphal thing, but I've actually had seen, talk to customers who said, oh yeah, I had PVC and every now and then it would just, burst open, things would fly around, and I guess go get a piece and fix it. I'm like, okay, um, not the safest thing in the world. Um, and again, usually not to code, all right? Um, all right, so some basic recommendations for piping. Uh, you wanna size for the low pressure drop, plan for the future in terms of the diameter of the pipe. Um, and then, this will be available, so I'm not gonna go through all these little tips, but um, these are just some smart, um, uh, tips for when you're planning or installing a uh, compressed air piping. Okay, so just a couple of closing comments um, that all the different, you know, we've talked about a variety of uh, 
products in a compressor system. Base, we didn't talk too much about the compressor, but all of these different things affect the air quality. So what type of compressor affects your air quality? Because if it's a piston, it's gonna have hotter air. If it's a piston, it will have typically more, more oil carryover. Now you can clean it up and dry it up. So I'm not pushing um, the, the, the rotary necessarily. It just as a point of design, they operate more coolly and they pass less oil. But there are products to clean up either, you know, the compressed air from either type of compressor. So um, there are many cases where a piston type is the right thing for a shop. Um, uh, so there's no doubt about that. But all these different things affect the air quality, and so you want to pay attention to them when you're selecting them. Okay, so the other thing about it is, the related to that point, is location matters. With dryers and compressors, which both are affected by heat, um, you want to have them, you want to avoid hot rooms, put it simply. Again, they're every 20 degree increase doubles the ability of air to hold moisture. Um, hot air is harder to dry, but also heat will kill a compressor. Probably won't kill a dryer, it just won't, it'll just make it less effective in drying air. But a heat can kill a compressor, um, and it, um, any, um, any type, okay? Um, so, um, so you want to put those those compressors in a well ventilated room, someplace you can get around them to do the service. You want to clean the the coolers on the compressors and clean the condensers on the dryers as part of your PM, um, so that they they operate better and work better and last longer. And I also recommend just hanging a thermometer in the compressor room so that you kind of have an idea of what it's like in there, um, because you may not realize how hot it is getting. Okay. All right, uh, these, are, these are links that you'll have in the, uh, in the PDF of this presentation, uh, some, some different uh, blog posts and, and resources, um, non-commercial, um, that you may find, find useful. Okay, and with that, I'm gonna wrap it up. I thank you for your attention, and if there are any questions, um, I will take them. All right. Well, thanks, Mike. I'm going to echo your your statement on nitrogen. I've painted with every different system that's come to the market, and I can't I can't really find a a huge value. Everybody's tried to explain to me it's material savings and some other things, but when I do my measure in my cups and control my fluids, that's yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I've tried them. I wanted them to work. Heated nitrogen in a paint gun was cool. But yeah, I mean, and the, and the the heated part, I'm I'm very intrigued by. Um, I haven't ever talked. You know, I go to NACE, uh, I go to Seymour every year, and uh, um, and I talk to a lot of folks uh, who are painting, and I, um, you know, and I look at um, you know the magazines and so forth. I haven't really seen a lot about it. I've just seen the products promoted. Um, so I'm intrigued. I, I'm not. I'm not. Um, you know, saying it's a bad idea. Nitrogen, I just think, because the whole benefit is you're getting clean, dry air, but you can get that without adding a nitrogen system in there. So I yeah. feel like that's excessive. Yep, yeah. I've had some companies that start down the pathway and they install the systems and they're like, oh my God, Christmas is the greatest thing ever. And then I, I talked to them six months later. I'm like, how's it going? They're like, yeah, we're not really using it anymore. And mm -hmm. um, it's kind of like one of those cool, t I like the generator systems now more than just, you know, the other, I mean, there's been some updates in the technology and um, but for yeah. a while, even your hand would get hot. You know, you're running heated air through your paint gun and you're holding a yeah. paint gun and you were like, wow. This is <laughs> yeah, a little uncomfortable. <laughs> I didn't even think of that aspect. Of it. So there was a lot there, but um, yeah. I don't see any chat questions in the chat. Right yeah, we got one. Oh, okay. okay. Is there a problem to have the dryer before the storage tank? Okay, so um, no, not necessarily. And so um, sometimes systems are done this way. Um, uh, we sometimes will do it that way. We typically recommend the tank first because it will remove sort of the bulk liquid that is coming out of the compressor. Um, and uh, because as soon as the compressed air comes out of the compressor, especially on a piston compressor, it's going to start to cool rapidly and you could get a, a good amount of condensation right there. And so you want to get it out bef you know, before it goes into the dryer so it doesn't o overload the drain in the dryer. Um, um, also, the, the tank, 
um, does those other things for the compressor, it provides the, the storage so the compressor can uh, pump up, shut off, cool down. But if, the, um, if there's something in between uh, the two, it might affect that cycling um, a little bit. Um, but I don't think it would um, be a critical, uh, critical error. Um, now, so the plus side is if you dry the air first, then you have a big tank full of dried air. So as long as the dryer is sized to accommodate the full flow at the current conditions, that would work too. All right. I think one of the things that's, that's important for, uh, so many of us didn't understand the role air played in refinishing until we got clean air. Mm -hmm. So then we were like, hmm, wow, this yeah. is it. Uh, so I know like right now, if, if I walked into, uh, you know, either Charlie Hutton's place or Foose's place and I tried to take their case or compressors and stuff from them, they would shoot me. Yeah. So. Well, and, and again, a lot of it is, you know, it is, thank you. I appreciate that. The, a lot of it is really about having the right sized machines and, a, and the dryer that is designed for its purpose um, so that it really, cause it will make that difference. And again, the, um, the, uh, um, there are a lot of folks out there making good dryers. Unfortunately, there are some lesser dryers out there, but there are plenty of good ones. They don't, they don't have to be yellow, sadly. Um, and it's, I, I will say this, I mean, I'm, in the past, it's one of those areas you sometimes go, well, I'm spending a lot of money on my paint booth. So you, you try to save me, and all of us in the shop, we're we mm -hmm. try to save money where we can, because right. there's some things we can't save money on we have to spend. And, right. and sometimes our air, air supply and air filtration is one of the things we try to save money on. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's hard to get the, the dollars of it. Um, but if you were to ask someone, okay, how much, how, uh, let's say the, the cost of putting in uh, the right dryer and filter combination is $1,000 more than you were going to spend. How many redos is that? How many hours of labor and how many, you know, uh, uh, pints of paint, you know, or, you know, like what is the, uh, and what's the, the cost of the through the change in throughput. So, if you look at it that that way, it might be you know two or three redos paid you know paid for that. And if you're doing if you're finding you have two or three a month, you definitely um, it makes financial sense to make that investment. Yep, clean air, uh, steady yeah. air, so I don't have yeah. an air drop if I'm going to go down right. the whole side of a vehicle. I need to have the same air pressure or defender as I do when it gets right. to the light. So <laughs> yes, especially with some of these finer metallics, and, I, and you know I I can. You can see some of that when you're when you're in the paint booth with some of these guys. You're like, and you're done. <laughs> Just yep. when you watch right. the air do this. So it's yeah. So one of the other things we talked about last time is that those um, those uh, little air. I I think they kind of look like hair dryers, but they're they're used to flash paint. They put them on trees two yep. two or three at a time or two or four at a time. Um, that use compressed air and um, uh, to to help flash the paint. Those just they suck up a lot of air. Yeah. So if you were talking about losing pressure, you know, it's like, so if you've got someone in one booth using those, um, you know, a couple of those uh, air amplifiers to, to flash a panel and then someone else is trying to use it, you know, a DA or something <laughs> or spray paint, then if your system is not sized for that full flow, you could have issues. Uh, may not be air quality issues, but it could be pressure drop. Right. Well, and that's, yeah, that's the thing about it. You, the constant volume, constant, you know, mm -hmm. it makes a difference. It, it yep. does. Since we got our reserve tank and then, you know, we plumbed in that loop, it's made a big difference. So, um, yeah. and I would have thought as small as we are, why do I need a reserve tank? But it, it turns out it, we, we kind of do. Yeah. So that's yeah. And, and, you know, a lot of times people ask, well, you know, uh, they know why the reserve tank is there. Um, on the piston compressor, which is you need it so you can pump it up to 175 and turn the compressor off to cool down because pistons are not designed to run 100%. Rotaries are vein and screw designed to run 100% of the time if you need them to. Um, so why do you need a tank? Well, you still want a tank for moisture removal, reduce the cycling of the compressor, meaning reducing the number of how much time it's on and how many times it turns on and off because that affects motor life um, for rotaries as well as pistons. So you still want a tank. We always recommend a tank um, regardless of the, of the system type. All right. Um, yeah. Looks like another so, question came in. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> it, and so this is a perfect timing, a great segue. 
Is there ever a time a piston compressor is a better choice than a rotary? Yeah, I mean, this is really about how much air you need, how often you need it, and how much you pay for a kilowatt of, of, of power. So from an air quality perspective, I feel confident saying the rotary type, vane or screw, is, is the foundation for better air quality um, and uh, better flows because they don't have to shut down to cool off. That said, if you're not running them all the time and you have a, a properly sized piston compressor and you have the air treatment you know, dryers and filters downstream, you won't be able to get it quite as dry as you would a rotary, but you could still get it clean enough to paint with uh, in most in most circumstances. Um, and again, the, the rotary is several times more expensive than the piston to buy. It costs a lot more to do an annual service. Um, uh, you know, it might cost you, uh, you know, for a 10 horsepower rotary, it might be a thousand or fifteen hundred dollars a year to do a full service on it. Okay. That's a lot of money. You could buy a piston compressor for that. So those are the downsides there. Um, and if you're only running it, you know, an hour or two a day, then it, the, the dollars don't, you know, it doesn't add up now, if you, but if you're running it more and you pay 15 cents a kilowatt, cause you're in Southern California or, or New York or Hawaii, which is closer to 20 cents a kilowatt, then you could actually, if you're running enough, if your compressor is big enough and you run enough hours on it, you could actually see the difference in your power bill. Um, noise is another thing. If you just have a, a problem where you can't, find a good place um, uh, to put the compressor where it's not going to cause heartburn uh, because of noise and vibration. The rotary can help with that, but at a cost. Um, so air quality, more, uh, more air per kilowatt because rotaries are more electrically efficient. They deliver more air for the same amount of power as a piston. Um, so more air, better air quality, more air, uh, less electricity, rotary. But if you're not running a lot, running a lot of air, running it a lot, the piston may be the way to go. Yeah, if you got. I think for those that may have more questions on the on, on that stuff too, the uh, previous webinar that we did on understanding compressed air systems for collision repair might provide some good information too. That was published on the 13th, so go back and take a look at that one. Jason's like Mr. Okay. Library. Oh yeah, appreciate that. that. Yeah. Um, so some other questions. Um, how do you calculate or, or select your, your condensation drain? Okay, so that is really about, typically the, the, the manufacturer spec sheet is gonna tell you what flows um, um, it will accommodate because basically the amount of flow is gonna uh, roughly uh, line up with how much moisture there can be in it. So. It, those, I mean, drains typically will come in, you know, four or five sizes. So it's, and they'll cover broad ranges. So it's not like you have to get super accurate with them. Um, so, um, um, but typically the, uh, the, the literature will, will give you a, a sense of, hey, if you have this size compressor and this size tank, you know, you may want this size drain. Um, and if someone has a specific uh, circumstance and they want to email me, I, th I think I have my email there, you know, I will, I can address these things and, and help get them, um, give them more specific uh, information. Okay. Um, another one coming here um, that I have a rotary compressor that's 17 years old. Looking forward, if I stay with rotary, how many techs per horsepower should I? Mm. So uh, typically um, the, uh, a compressor will put out, um, if it's a piston, somewhere in the range of three and a half CFM per horsepower. A rotary is going to be four to four and a half. Again, depends on the model. So there, there are some very low efficiency pistons that may only put out three. And then there are some ones that may get closer to, you know, 3.75 CFM per. But, um, you know, a, um, a tech, if he's running, you know, um, a DA, you know, some sort of a sander grinder. I mean, those are chewing up 15, 20 CFM. So that's a five horsepower compressor right there, roughly. And again, the rotary might give you an edge, but you know, um, so there might be a point where if you had a five horsepower rotary and you wanted to go with a piston, you might have to make it a seven and a half to make up for that difference in flow and, and duty cycle. Because again, the, 
the piston can't run as often. So you need to run at a higher pressure, store the air, let it stop and cool off, but still have an air, the airflow in reserve. Okay. So the rotary does have that flow advantage. And, and you know, if you have um, uh, more techs, uh, I mean, if you, you know, using air at the same time, um, the rotary does have that advantage of delivering air constantly. Um, and again, I again, think that was another topic too that you dove in quite a bit to last time too. So um, yeah. So Tom, if you if you jump over into the into the webinar playlist on YouTube and find the last webinar, um, Michael did a really good job of breaking down technician air volume usage, um, horsepower, whether you wanted to use two alternating or a single. Right. Pretty cool. Yep. Uh, yeah. Jason, Mr. Again? Johnny on the spot, drops it right there. Yeah, thank you. Oh, there we go. Perfect. Thank you. Um, awesome. Ba -ba -ba -ba. Anything, anybody else want to chime in and type your question or unmute yourself okay. and say hi? Okay. There's my follow up, please. Okay. Um, all right. So you have a. Are you reading that one, Michael? Yes, I oh. am. Okay. Can you tell by the look on my face? I was just um, saying, well, I need to clarify. Everyone so, can, can uh, chime yeah. in and ask a question except right. Dr. Long. He cannot. <laughs> okay. Sure okay. So basically, um, uh, Tom Tom is asking if you have a dryer and a drain at the compressor because sometimes it's they're all they're some there it's all built in one. Would you need the drains throughout the shop? Okay. So two hundred feet away, um, um, you you might not if the temperature of the room is not cooling the compressed air in the pipe okay so if it gets cool at one end of the shop you might have some residual moisture so that's why a lot of like the filter regulator lubricators the little point of use frls sometimes have a little drain a little mini drain okay um so but if if you have in the compressor room or if you have like an all-in-one you know uh, compressor, dryer, drain all together, it's going to get, you know, most of it all out. And as long as that air doesn't get cooled later, you should be fine. But it is good, you know, um, maybe to have something downstream just to have a play, a drip leg or something so that if there is any con condensation, you have a place to remove it. Thank you. Yep. Haven't I? So, Michael, you can go ahead and say, um, talking crazy but haven't i seen you guys kind of plumb that in too when you lay in the air pipe like little you know where it goes right. the pipe goes a little lower and that's for that drain is a little yes less, yeah so one of the things that um uh, people often do is um they will slightly slope the compressed air piping at least for a certain distance after it leaves the uh the tank Um, and you may just want them, um, you don't have to have lots of them, you just periodically, or maybe just at the, if you have one long straight line, you may just want to have one at the end. Uh, again, points of use often have them built in, like you'll see when the, when the drop comes off the, the header, comes down the wall, there's going to be your, you know, let's say it's a, an FRL for a, a DA, you know, uh, sander um, connection, you'll have uh, a little part of the pipe that continues past it. And there's a little petcock on the bottom, and you can drain the water off there. That's something that the individual user should just do. If they have those things, they should just do that. Could also be a, a ball valve. Excellent. My uh, my internet cut out for a minute. I'm glad to see y'all got to keep going. But uh, okay. <laughs> any so, other questions? Oh. Yeah. Yeah, happy to answer questions. Um, as long as you got them. And also I do ask if you have any uh, uh, comments on the presentation, like if it answered questions you needed to be answered or if it missed something that you were looking for, um, I'd like to know that so I can uh, improve it. Perfect. All right.
Well, Michael, we're going to let you go. I'm sure it's a Monday. Okay. You're having the Monday like all the rest of us, right? Yep. Yep. So, <laughs> all right. Well, we are back again. Uh, Jason, is it three o'clock? We are at two o'clock central two o'clock. time with Major Swan. All right. So determining when to measure and why, which, you know, I say measure all the time anyway. So <laughs> yeah. measure, measure twice. Measure again. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, all right. Well, thanks, guys. Have a all fantastic day. All right. Thank you very day. much. Stay healthy. Bye-bye. Thanks. Matt, you too.